We have gathered here this morning to worship God. We have come seeking comfort, inspiration, community, challenge, and insight. We gather to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst and seek God's strength for the changing of the seasons in our church, in our world, and in our lives. We welcome you to New England Church this morning, come to you live through the technology of live streaming. Nobody is in the room today, which seems a little strange, but we welcome those of you who are watching live streaming or on the video. We have chosen to follow the guidelines of the Illinois Department of Health and Governor Pritzker to postpone meeting in person at least through November. Therefore, our service will be abbreviated to include a sermon and a prayer bookended by the music of our organist, Marsha Foxgrover. Likewise, all church activities and building use have been suspended for the next two weeks. We will reevaluate at the end of the month and decide what to do then. The annual Interfaith Thanksgiving service will be held virtually via Zoom next Sunday, November 22nd at 3 o'clock. The Zoom link is in the e-blast that was sent this morning. And for our prayers, while I know of no one specifically in the hospital, please keep those families who have been touched by the virus, including several of our church families. We will thank you for your continued support and prayers for them. I invite you then to moments of silent prayer and meditation before I lead us in prayer. Eternal spirit of life, whom we praise with reverent lips, but all too often undermine with insensitive hearts, grant us today a vital experience of your refreshing presence. Clarify our thoughts, elevate our spirits, deepen our faith, and challenge our platitudes, that we may find in these moments set apart a new claim on abundant living for having been here, if only virtually. During these difficult days of a virus that is forcing us to reevaluate life and distance ourselves from all that is familiar, we pray you to give us what we need to live by faith as best we can. Remind us of all that makes life rich and beautiful, our homes, our families, our church, our community, and the modern technology that allows us to stay in touch through our phones and Zoom and social media. Remind us of our friends who laugh with us, friends who console us in our grief, friends who know that we're not perfect and who like us anyway, friends who accept us just as we are. When we are weary of quarantining at home, when we are exhausted by the need for caution, 
when we begin to feel sorry for ourselves because we can't do what we'd like to do, remind us of the importance of protecting our health and the health of those around us. Remind us of the frontline workers who can't stay home because they are caring for people who are ill and dying of the virus. When we realize that Thanksgiving and Christmas will not be what we are used to, remind us of those families who have lost loved ones who will never be at the Thanksgiving table or around the Christmas tree again and make us grateful for all that we have. And for our country, we pray, for we live in difficult times when anger and violence rise out of the ashes of defeat, when friends are seen as enemies, when politics becomes a means for personal advancement rather than the difficult work of compromise for the good of the whole. We pray you to lead us with the light of truth through these dark days. And for ourselves, we pray that we may be responsible in our call to be the body of Christ. May we not fail in our mission to bring peace, to love people as they are, and to rise to the occasion that invites our service to the community, the nation, and the world. May we not complain about wearing our masks, but see it as part of our duty for the welfare of all. We pray you, Holy God, to enlarge our vision, our generosity, and our dedication, that we may deserve your approval as good and faithful servants. In the spirit of the Christ of peace who taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Matthew's Gospel in the 16th chapter where we hear these words. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some said John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And these words from the book of Psalm in the 131st chapter. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a child with its mother. My soul is like the child that is within me. Hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. Simon Peter was pretty sure of himself here and it garnered the accolades of Jesus for the faith that he espoused. But this scripture was written some 70 years or more after Jesus had died, which had given the church a long time to sort out their beliefs and doubts and retell the story in a way that succinctly portrayed the evolution of their beliefs. We mustn't forget when we read this passage, however, that this is the same Simon Peter who stepped out of the boat to join Jesus on the surface of the water, only to sink beneath it because of his doubts. We mustn't forget that this is the same Simon Peter who denied even knowing Jesus when doing so would have meant his own death. The Simon Peter of this story isn't the model of faith we are sometimes told to emulate. Even so, 
This was an honest doubting that ultimately drew him to the statement of faith that he makes in this story. If we are honest with ourselves, I think most of us have had doubts, large and small, about our faith, about the nature or even the existence of God, and about the way God is involved or not involved in the world. Have you ever harbored the sense that religion makes no sense? That there is no rhyme nor reason to what happens in the world? That your prayers are falling on deaf ears? I will admit that the same doubts have haunted me over the years of my ministry, rendering me mute and dumbfounded in responding to those heart-rending situations where a young child's death seems totally incongruous with a loving God, yet forced to say some words of hope at a funeral service where the grieving are torn apart by the inadequacy of their belief. I have confessed to you before that I have a love-hate relationship with the organized church and with the God that is often defined by the church. What is the purpose of religion, of church, of ministry, if we can't justify the ways of God to a heartbroken world? I continue to search for the answer to that question, but I decided many years ago that there will never be an answer to that question. Even so, I am convinced that the struggle to find an answer is part of my faith journey. I am deeply suspicious of the certitude that religion is supposed to engender. I weary of those who profess to have all the answers. I get angry when platitudes attempt to justify God's inaction. The Hindu tradition puts it this way, truth has many aspects. Infinite truth has infinite expressions. Though the sages speak in various ways, they express one and the same truth. Ignorant is the one who says, what I say and know is true, others are wrong. It is because of this attitude of the ignorant that there have been doubts and misunderstandings about God. It is this attitude that causes dispute. But all doubts vanish when one attains tranquility by realizing the heart of truth. Thereupon dispute, too, is at an end. I take heart in the Nobel-winning Rabbi Isaac Singer's statement when he says, Doubt is part of all religion. All the religious thinkers were doubters. And I find comfort and company in philosopher André Gide's statement, Believe those who are seeking the truth. Doubt those who find it. A healthy sense of doubt is important for people of faith. I've always maintained that believers of all faiths should be agnostics, for by definition, God is indefinable, mystery, indescribable spirit who, like the wind, blows wherever it wants. We can know the presence of God in our daily experiences, to be sure, and know the occasional literal or large miracles. But no one knows completely the ways of God with much breadth or much certainty. We are finite. God is infinite. As the psalmist says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. We are called people of faith, not people of answers. We are called to live by faith, not by platitudes or even certitudes. Rabbi Daniel Polish reminds us that this is the most challenging kind of faith, to live with a God we cannot fully understand whose actions we explain at our own peril. This God is at the center of our lives, and this may be a rockier path to walk than that of either simplistic absolutism or of atheism. But it is the faith of honest women and men, a faith defined by spiritual humility. The value of religion in our lives is not for the answer that it provides, 
but for the honesty that can be known in relationship with God and with one another. The importance of church is in the community that we can trust with our intense fears, our harshest criticisms, our intense doubts, our deepest, darkest secrets, and know that we will still be included. In the face of unexplainable tragedy and unrelenting grief, it is relationships in the communion of others that offer up the presence of God in real and tangible ways. We know God, for example, most vividly in the neighbor who has offered up a shoulder as an altar for our tears. We know God most tangibly in the silent presence of a friend who walks with us through our anger and our fears without trying to justify what God has done or hasn't done. We often ask, where was God in the Holocaust? Where is God in this pandemic, for that matter? I don't know. But I glimpse a, a bit of God in those who harbored vict victims under the Nazi regime at risk of their own lives. And I see God on the front line caring for those with the virus, wearing a mask, and mustering every bit of energy they can to continue their exhausting work. Faith is about living in community with one another to comfort and console, to strengthen and challenge and instill joy even when God appears to be the enemy working against us rather than the Savior who takes away all of our problems. People of faith possess certain keys for locking and unlocking the well-being of others. So regardless of our ability to understand or explain God, we can reach out when it seems that God is not there to act on behalf of a God of love in whom we trust, even though we don't know completely. We can encourage people to wear their masks even when it's tedious to do so. We can be part of the stay-at-home crowd instead of the traditional Thanksgiving dinner with family, even when we don't want to. Though Simon Peter eventually espoused his heartfelt belief with certainty, he, as we, spend a lifetime of doubting before we get there. So having gathered here today, if only through the modern miracle of live streaming and video, we can go out to live by faith, embracing a doubt, a devout doubt about God, about our understanding of God, yet committed all the more to unlocking whatever opportunities are ours to facilitate heaven on earth. In spite of, and maybe because of, our doubt, we are able to live by faith in an infinite God while living abundantly in our finite world. And now as you go out, go out renewed for having been here in the presence of God and one another to serve and to live by faith.